my eighth grade students. Today has been our first spirit day. And so in honor of Ms. Stanton, Ms. Elevitz, and our collegiate leaders and spirit day, uh, my costume today is Chewbacca. Yep, got Chewbacca going here. And um, hope you had some fun with it as well, eighth graders. So we are still reading The Greatest Treasure Hunt in History, which I knew very little about this story until I started reading this book with you. We are beginning at the bottom of page 34, the bottom of page 34. After dusting himself off and trying to adjust for the deafening boom and vibration of the Howitzer Cannon, Keller entered the palace to discover a makeshift first aid station. Boom! A French military doctor was treating three wounded French colonial soldiers. Keller attempted to make an introduction and explain why he was there, but continuous artillery fire drowned out his words. He could barely hear himself. Boom! Sizing up the scholarly middle-aged Fifth Army officer standing before him, the French doctor assumed it had something to do with the two large crates leaning against the wall, so he pointed to them. Boom! Keller walked over to the crates for a closer look. Someone had cut helmet-sized holes in the sides of both crates and then removed the packing material and flannel wrapping to see what was inside. What person wouldn't have been curious, he thought. He certainly was. For a moment, as he crouched down on one knee to peer inside the hole, Keller was oblivious to the sound of the artillery, the blood on the floor, and even the injured soldiers. His eyes needed a few seconds to adjust to the diminished light. And then time stopped. Staring back at him was an old friend, the Madonna and Child panel of the Maesta, Siena Cathedral's high altar piece and the city's most iconic work of art. He'd last seen the seven by 30 foot double-sided wood panel painting now disassembled as a student almost two decades earlier. The Sienese artist, Ducio di Buonsega, Segna, created the exquisitely refined painting of the Madonna and Child, surrounded by angels and saints between 1308 and 1311. Ducio used vivid colors to paint his figures with delicacy and tenderness, a style that influenced two centuries of artists who followed. And now Keller had found it, 633 years later, in the middle of a war zone. The altarpiece appeared safe, and from what he could see, undamaged. Other smaller paintings, about 40 in all, lay hidden inside the palace chapel. Keller examined each one before individually wrapping them in blankets to create a measure of protection against the constant vibration. Nearby, he noticed a protected monument sign posted by order of the German commander Kesselring. In this instance, it appeared that German troops have respected it. For now, unable to post guards, all Keller could do was notify artificials in Siena that the Maesta had come through the battle safely. So this is a um, picture of it that was painted in the 1300s. And that's what he just found. Florence, Italy, late July, 1944. With Fifth Army giving chase, German forces continued their strategic retreat north to the Gothic line, intending to make a stand in the Apennine Mountains. Directly in their path lay Florence, the capital city of Tuscany, and the single greatest concentration of art in the world. Siena and Rome had been lucky. Would Florence, with its magnificent churches, beautiful bridges, and irreplaceable works of art be so fortunate? And where were the city's paintings, sculptures, and other artistic treasures? Had they been moved back into the city as officials in Rome believed? Or were they still in the various countryside villas surrounding Florence at risk of being stolen or worse, destroyed? Second Lieutenant Fred Hart, Regional Monuments Officer for Tuscany, was determined to find the answer. 
Hart was an impassioned, at times impetuous, and immensely talented art historian who had spent more than half of his life studying Italian artists and their works. His gift for the arts was apparent from an early age. While most of his schoolmates longed to be on the athletic fields, Hart was lost in a world of French Gothic cathedrals, Italian Renaissance sculpture, and Oriental silk screens. At 30 years of age, he was at least 10 years younger than the other Monuments men, which spoke to the level of respect for his ability. His gangling appearance, accented by dark, heavy room glasses, masked a brilliant scholar with a photographic memory and boundless energy. When he arrived in Italy in mid-January 1944, Hart had been assigned to a photographic interpretation unit assessing collateral damage to nearby monuments caused by Allied bombing. He hated his job. Volunteering for military service had been a personal quest to help save the art of Italy. Instead, he found himself confirming its destruction. Relentless and impatient, he looked for ways to wrangle a transfer into the monument section. On April 6th, he wrote Ernest DeWall, director of the MFAA in Italy, pleading for a transfer. His orders came through two weeks later. Here's a picture of Second Lieutenant Fred Hart. So he is the youngest monuments man. Man, He is 30 years old, um, which is quite a feat for him to be selected to um, protect, if you will, to identify uh, the most precious art in Europe. Um, this is a picture of the church, um, the obliterated courtyard of Santa Maria uh, in Milan. And um, the Last Supper is covered by a wooden scaffolding. And uh, that's where the painting is located. Shortly before departing for the new assignment as Monuments Man, Hart prepared reports summarizing bomb damage in 16 Italian cities. After checking and rechecking one of the photographs, adjusting the overhead lamp with one hand while repositioning his magnifying glass with the other, he was sure. On the night of August 15th, 1943, a British high explosive bomb had completely obliterated the courtyard of the Santa Maria del Grazi Church in Milan and all but the northwest corner of its dining hall. Hart couldn't be certain, but as best he could tell, given the resolution of the photograph, the wall containing Leonardo da Vinci's greatest masterpiece, The Last Supper, may have been reduced to rubble. It was a bitter realization that he and the other monuments men feared might be repeated in the Tuscan capital. On July 27th, Hart pulled up to British 8th Army headquarters in a battered army jeep with worn tires, defective shock absorbers, and a shattered windshield. Unlike most military vehicles, his had a name. At some point in its storied existence, whether in North Africa or Sicily, no one knew someone had painted Lucky 13 across the metal riser that once contained a windshield. Hart knew that just having a vehicle was a stroke of luck, even one as beat up as his. Like Keller, he guarded his Jeep like a cowboy did his horse. It was that important. Hart and the other officers and soldiers of 8th Army were eager to get into Florence and begin inspections. He would first visited Italy in 1936 and dreamed of returning ever since. The thought that German forces would use his beloved city as a defensive fortification, risking damage to hundreds of years of beauty, sickened him. Several days later, while eating breakfast in the officers' mess at British 8th Army headquarters, Hart heard a stunning announcement broadcast by BBC Radio. Winfred Bond Thomas, a veteran correspondent, accompanied by Major Eric Linklater of the British Royal Engineers, had stumbled upon an art repository in the middle of a major battle zone just outside Florence. It contained masterpieces from two of the city's most important museums. 
the Uffizi Gallery and the Palatine, Palatine Gallery housed inside the Pitti Palace. Rome officials had been grievously wrong. The Florentine treasures had not been moved back into the city. Hart felt exhilaration and horror all at once. Mind-jarring images of unprecedented art-filled villas dotting the Tuscan countryside filled his head. This is one of the castles that we're going to read about. Make sure you're looking at the pictures in this book. It has some wonderful photographs and information. Never one to sit still, Hart immediately sought authorization to drive to the art repository, the castle of Monte Gafani, to secure it and report back as quickly as possible. Permission in hand, Hart, armed and helmeted, jumped into Lucky 13 and headed out. Heavy art artillery fire blocked portions of the route, forcing him onto alternate roads so small they didn't appear on his maps. Stops at numerous military checkpoints chewed up more time. Throughout the journey, the night sky flickered from the constant flashes of art artillery. Exhausted after spending almost 12 hours driving and near 83 miles, Hart decided to spend the night at 8th Army Press Camp at San Donato in Poggio. So this is the castle he's headed to. He's trying to find that castle. And I read to the bottom of this page and then we'll continue tomorrow. That evening, Hart met with Vaughn Thomas and Major Linklater, who had just returned to camp after spending the day checking on three additional art repositories nearby. Did they ever have a story to tell? Linklater who had been commissioned to write the official history of the English Army campaign, had been eager to visit the 8th Indian Infantry Division, just one of the many multinational components of British 8th Army. He and Vaughn Thomas had arrived at the castle of Montecafoni on the afternoon of July 30th. Enemy forward positions were now just a little more than a mile away from the castle. While waiting to interview the second commander, Linklater and Vaughn Thomas had wandered through the cavernous building and noticed various groups of panel paintings leaning against the wall. Hart couldn't believe what he was hearing, especially the fact that the paintings were not in crates and that the painted surface was visible rather than facing the wall as an added measure of protection. And I think this is a picture of what he's about to find. Okay, we're going to stop there. Page 43, pick up tomorrow. Thanks so much. I hope you have a really good evening. Take care.